If you have your Bible, let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41 is where we're going to be today. That's in the Old Testament. Isaiah 41. The other day, um, Liam and I were, were trying to get our kids to go to bed. And if you're a parent, you know that this can be one of the most stressful and frustrating events in all of parenting, right? Kids go to, uh, go to sleep every single night. And yet every single night, they seem to forget how to go to sleep. I don't know if you all have experiences in your own home, but every night we have to go through the, through the same song and dance in order to get our kids to go to bed. I naively think that my saying, go to bed, should be sufficient. It is not in our house, right? Every night is the same thing. And then on top of just trying to get them to, to go to bed, right, there's the issue of, of fear. Now, Zoe and Elijah, they don't have this issue anymore, as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, Alana, who is seven, she doesn't have too many fears at night. But Ziana, our five-year-old, she will cry for mommy almost every night. She will say that she's scared of, of this or that, and it's most nights. Right? She either wants to sleep in our bed, which ain't happening, or she wants to have Liam sleep in her room, which ain't happening. But because Liam is such an awesome mom, she can go and get her calmed down and get her in the bed. I just get frustrated and I just roll over and say, you got to deal with it. I'm going to explode because I don't understand it. That's beside the point. But what makes a child run to mom and dad when they're afraid? Why does a child cry for mom or dad when he's afraid. See, a child understands two things. The child understands that, that they are helpless and mom and dad are invincible. Right? That's what kids think, right? They're helpless, but mom and dad, mostly mom, is invincible, right? And can do anything. Maybe your house is like mine, right? They think Liam is invisible and Liam can do anything, right? They think I'll just suffice if Liam's not available. That's how kids think. They're small, they're weak, and moms and dads, they're big and they're strong. They instinctively know this. When they're scared, they have no problem running to us. When they're frustrated, they have no problem running to mom and dad. When they're stressed out, they have no problem running to mom and dad. Kids know who they are and kids know who their parents are. Right? Kids never wonder about who to ask for help. Kids never call their friends in the middle of the night asking if they know any older people who could come in and make them feel safe. Kids know whom to go to when they're scared or sad or lonely or angry. They know who they are. But they know who their parents are. But then something happens, right? Kids become teenagers, and their willingness to run to mom and dad begins to diminish, right? And then they turn 17 or 18, and they decree that they know all things, and they don't need mom and dad anymore. And as we grow, we begin to lean into this idea of individualism, right? We allow our, we allow our pride to take over. We begin to believe that it's up to ourselves to fix whatever is messed up in our lives. As we age, we gain this inflated view of ourselves. And as we struggle, as we fear the unknown or we fear the known, as we drown in stress, we fail to, to lean into what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18. When he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as the, this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We fail to lean into this call to be like children. Now hear me, this is a nicer way of saying something that God said to the prophet of Isaiah in chapter 41 that we're going to read here in a minute. All right? Here Jesus says, be like a child. But I want you to see what God said to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 41 verse 14. He said... Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. 
I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. Now, I will let you choose which description you like better, a child or a worm. But the meaning is the same. It's a designation of helplessness. Now, when we're told to embrace the imagery of a child, we think it's beautiful, right? We don't have too much trouble with it. But I'm guessing none of us would appreciate someone calling us a worm. Because it seems like a derogatory term. Hearing someone call you a worm doesn't normally lead to warm and fuzzy feelings. And so it's normal for us to read this verse and just go, huh, that's odd. Why would God call Jacob a worm? Why would he insult Jacob or Israel this way? Why, why would God insult anyone that way? In fact, Liam and I had this conversation just the other week while we were on our, on our trip. We read this passage together. And we, we stopped at that word, worm. And I know I've read this verse several times in my life, right? Isaiah 41 is the most encouraging chapters in all the Bible. Isaiah 41, 10 in particular, is like the go-to verse for people who are struggling with, with fear. We're going to get there in a moment. But as I read Isaiah 41, I just couldn't get past God calling Jacob and Israel a worm. Right? It just, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. See, when I read the Bible, I hear what God says to people like Jacob or David or Moses or anyone else, and I see as if he's talking directly to me, which is the case, FYI, right? It is the, the living word of God, and he talks to us. We talked about last week. He talks to us through his word. And so when I read about him calling Jacob a worm, I heard him calling me a worm, and there was a part of me that just did not like that. Right? I have enough pride in myself to believe I am better than a worm. I have enough of an ego to believe I am better than a worm. And my mama thinks I'm pretty special. <laughs> amen, mom? Amen. Say amen. Thank amen. you. <laughs> you haven't picked up on it yet. We are living in one of the most narcissistic times in human history. Right? Nothing matters more than my truth. Nothing matters more than my definition of reality. There is no room in this worldview for embracing the term worm. And so our response is just to skip over the beginning of chapter 14. Or we choose not to ask why God called Jacob a worm. Right? It's one of those uncomfortable things in the Bible that we just try to overlook or maybe explain away. But here's the big truth for today. Verse 14, and in fact, all of chapter 41, hinges on us embracing our worminess. Yes, I made up that word. Look at verse 14 again. Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid. People of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. Notice there are two parties mentioned in this verse. There's Jacob and then there's God. Two parties. And those two parties are described in very different ways, right? Jacob is a lowly worm. But God, God, he is the Redeemer. He is the Holy One. Now, let's for a moment insert ourselves in this passage. All right, if we insert ourselves into this passage, there are two roles that we can claim for ourselves. We can see ourselves as Jacob, or we can see ourselves as God. Right? We can see ourselves as the worm, or we can see ourselves as the redeemer or the holy one. What gets us into a lot of trouble in our lives is the fact we get those roles mixed up. Right? I don't know anyone who stands in front of the mirror as they get ready for their day and tells them over and over and over again, you are nothing but a worm. You are nothing but a worm. You're nothing but a worm. Now go have a great day. No one does that, right? I don't know any parents who wake their kids up every morning and say, Good morning, my precious worm. No parent does that, right? And yet maybe we should. Maybe we should start calling our kids worms. 
Maybe we should start telling ourselves every morning that we are worms. Because here's the thing, church. God wasn't saying anything derogatory. God wasn't being mean or rude. It wasn't like God looked down at Jacob or Israel, saw how fearful they were, and thought he would add to their misery by calling them worms. Worms. God was not pouring it on. God wasn't trying to make things worse. He wasn't trying to insult anyone. You see, God speaks freedom. Y'all need to hear that today. God speaks freedom. Freedom. When God speaks, freedom follows. God does not speak bondage. When God speaks, freedom follows. God does not speak death into our lives. God does not speak defeat into our lives. God doesn't speak misery or stress or trouble into our lives. God speaks freedom. God speaks life. And God speaks hope. Therefore, when God called Israel a worm, he was setting Jacob free. Again, in verse 14, there's two parties, Jacob and God. In order for Jacob to fully embrace how God is described in that passage, he must first fully embrace how he is described in that passage. You see, by embracing his worminess, he is embracing not only how his God views him, but also the world, how the world sees him. By embracing his warmness, he's not only embracing how God sees him, but he's also embracing how the world is going to see him. See, I don't think a worm has ever wondered why the pigeon is trying to eat it, right? I mean, let's assume for a moment that worms are able to think. Okay, just go with me here, all right, please? I don't think any worm has ever laid in bed in the morning and just said, oh, why me? Oh, poor me, right? Why is the pigeon picking on me? I, I can't even leave, leave my house without pigeons trying to eat me. Life is not fair. Oh, poor me. I don't think a worm has ever done that. The worm knows he's a worm, and that is the life of a worm. No worm looks at the pigeon and says, don't you know who I am? Worms don't have egos. They're worms. I think we all to forget we are worms. And then get offended or shocked when the pigeons of the world try to eat us. So Jesus said it pretty bluntly in John 16, 33 when he said, In this world you will have trouble. I don't know how much clearer it can be. And yet when life gets hard, when we have trouble, we get shocked, appalled, offended. We say things like, I don't deserve this. Why me? But when you embrace your worthiness, you understand that you are attacked because alone you are completely vulnerable. See, there is nothing Someone say nothing. nothing. There is nothing we can do on our own to protect against all attacks. There is nothing we can do on our own to defeat all attack attackers. We are just worms. And that is how the world sees us. That's how the enemy sees us, as helpless worms. It's also how our God sees us. But instead of attacking us, our God comes to our rescue. I mentioned earlier that Isaiah 41.10 is the most popular, one of the most popular verses in all the Bible. So look at it with me. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, God is saying, you are but a worm. But do not fear because I'm with you. You're a worm, but don't be dismayed because I'm your God. You're a worm, and so I will strengthen you and I will help you. You're a worm, so I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is saying, you're a worm, but let me show you who I am. You're hungry, I am the bread of life. You're stuck in the darkness, I am the light of the world. You feel lost, 
I am the good shepherd. You feel dead. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am that I am. This is who Jesus is. He is the great I am. Amen. 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 Which lets us be the helpless worms we are. And yet, we constantly try to be something or someone we're not. Right? We want to be the great defender. We want to be the answer to other people's problems. We want to be the great provider. We want the praise. We want the glory. But the only way for us to fully experience the glory of the Lord is for us to fully embrace our helpless nature. And that is what we don't want to embrace. We don't want to think of ourselves as helpless. We don't want to think that we aren't capable of fixing what is broken in our marriage. We don't want to think we aren't able to change the thoughts that we're having. We don't want to think that we are powerless to stop giving into that temptation, right? We do not want to look weak. We don't want to hand over control. We want to fight back because we want to be the ones who defeat the enemy. But hear me, church, you cannot do it. Look at what the Apostle uh, Paul wrote. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. You see, we are going to have trouble. We're going to be perplexed. We're going to be hunted. We, we will be knocked down. This is the life of a worm. And alone, the worm will be crushed. Alone, the worm will be driven to despair. The worm will be abandoned. The worm will be destroyed. But when we, when we embrace who we are and who our God is, then nothing thrown at us will ever destroy us. Because of who our God is, we will not be crushed. Because of who our God is, we will not be driven to despair. Because of who our God is, we will not be abandoned by him. Because of who our God is, we will not be destroyed. Because of who God is and not who we are. God did not call Jacob a worm to belittle him. God called him a worm to set him free. Free from the lie that he could solve his own problems. Free from the lie that he could conquer all of his challenges. Freedom to let go and to trust him. You see, church, this is who we're called to be. David wrote in Psalm 139, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It's one, one of those other popular passages from Scripture. Right? It's one of those lines you might print out and hang on your bathroom mirror because it makes us feel good. It makes us throw our shoulders back and, and march out into the world. But do we understand what God made when he made us? See, the Hebrew word here for fearfully means with great reverence or with heartfelt interest, with respect. The Hebrew word for wonderfully means unique or set apart. God created us with great reverence. But that doesn't make us anything more than a worm when compared to God. And frankly, church, I'm okay with that. Because I've tried to be more than a worm in my life. I've only made my life worse. When the hard times came and I forgot that I'm but a worm, the hard times got the best of me. Right? When scary days came and I forgot that I'm nothing but a worm, I gave in to fear. When the stressful times came and I forgot I'm nothing but a worm, I lashed out at people. You see, I'm okay embracing my worminess because I know who my God is. I'm okay embracing my worminess because I know what, God, what my God says. Look back in Isaiah 41. It says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my righteous, by my victorious right hand. See, all your anger enemies lie there confused and humiliated. Anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. You will look in vain for those who tried to conquer you. Those who attack you will come to nothing. 
For I hold you by your right hand. I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. I'm here to help you. Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. You will be a new threshing instrument with many sharp teeth. You will tear your enemies apart, making chaff of mountains. You will toss them into the air, and the wind will blow them all away. A whirlwind will scatter them. Then you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy search for water and there is none, and their tongues are parched with thirst, then I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will never abandon them. I will open up rivers for them on the high plateaus. I will give them fountains of water in the valleys. I will fill the desert with pools of water. Rivers fed by springs will flow across the parched ground. I will plant trees in the barren desert, cedar, acacia, myrtle, uh, myrtle olive, cypress, fir, and pine. I'm doing this so all who see this miracle will understand what it means, that it is the Lord who has done this, the Holy One of Israel who created. You see, the church, the church, hear me, the worm didn't do nothing. It's the Lord who did it all. When we fully embrace our worminess, we get to fully enjoy the glory of the Lord. We get to share in his victories. We get to share in his righteousness. We get to share in his holiness. On our own, we will die as worms. With Jesus, we will rise to glory with the King. On our own, we will lose the fear. On our own, we will lose the stress. On our own, we will lose the anxiety. On our own, we will lose, period. Hear me, worms of East Cobb. You will face troubles in this life. The enemy will attack you, but you can't fight your battles on your own and hope to win. Why? Because it's not your battle to fight. 2 Chronicles 20.15 says, He said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. It's not your battle. It's not your battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle with grief. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle with fear. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle with anxiety. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle with self-hate. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle with loneliness. Some of you feel like you're losing the battle for your marriage. And so if that's you, I want you to say to yourself right now, and I mean say this to to yourself right now, the battle is not mine. The battle belongs to the Lord. Say it again. The battle is not mine. The battle belongs to the Lord. Say it again, church. The battle is not mine. The battle belongs to the Lord. Don't hate your worminess. Don't resent your your worm is, embrace your worm is because there is freedom in being a worm. It's the freedom in knowing that you cannot win, but he can and he has. And he's for you. He will not abandon you. So don't be afraid. He's for you. He's beside you. He's going to go before you and behind you. So there's nothing greater than the great I am. So why are you trying to do it all on your own? It's time to fully embrace who you are. It's time to fully embrace who he he is. So here's what I want us to do in the time we have left. I want us to turn our attention to who he is. We're so good at focusing on ourselves, right? We're so good at focusing on on our problems, we often forget to focus on who he is. We forget to proclaim who he is. And so in the time we have left, I want us to sing some songs that proclaim who he is. But this isn't just a time to to sing along while you think about where you're going to go for lunch. This is a time to allow our souls to sing to our Savior. This is time to take the words of these songs and make them our own from deep within us to claim these words as our own. And as you sing these words, as you proclaim who he is, 
Let your stress just be washed away. Let your fear be washed away. Let your doubts be washed away. Let your negative thoughts be washed away. Right now, we're going to focus on who he is because we know he is our protector. He is our provider. He is our peace. He is our hope. He is our salvation. He is our savior. And he is worthy of our praise. Amen. And so we're going to praise him. So I invite you to stand right now and let's praise him. Elijah, let's praise him. Come on.